Elite Church, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, excited that we get to continue in our study in the book of Mark and get to worship together. But before we do, we wanted to give you just a few announcements that are really important that are coming up. Uh, number one, our summer open tables are launching today. So if you've been looking for an opportunity to get connected, please check out our website or social media to sign up for those. Also, Lectio Divina journals just came out. They started July 1st, so it's a great time to grab one of those. You can get them at either one of our Sunday gatherings, but they are going fast. So I'd encourage you to do that sooner than later. Um, also, please check out the website for our summer day camp for kids as well as the summer camp for youth. Both of those dates are fast approaching and we need your prayer, support, and then for, for the kids camp, we still are looking for leaders to join. Um, and then the last thing is if you missed last Sunday's sermon, if I could strongly encourage you to actually go back and listen to that, it's just under the tab Future Sunday. Where we, Jen and I just spent some time just laying out what we believe the future of Light Church to be in the months and years to come. Um, and would love for you to be able to catch that, hear that, and walk forward. Um, a part of that is there are three specific initiatives that we are inviting you as a church to pray towards, give towards, serve towards. Um, one is right here in Encinitas. We are going to be um, renovating our children's space at La Paloma. Uh, so we're going to be adding a room and a restroom and a new fence and an entrance way. Uh, if you, uh, if your kids go there, if you have a heart to provide a welcoming and safe place for kids, uh, we would love for you to sew into that. You can just do that on our giving tab and just click under La Paloma Love and it'll go directly to that. Also, uh, just our continued work in Mexico, which you guys have already been so generous towards. Thank you for that. And the last thing has to do with the announcement we made last week, that we have officially uh, stepped in as the new senior pastors of Soul Church in downtown San Diego. So that is becoming a light church, uh, and that will relaunch this coming September, and we are actively working right now on building the pastoral team that will go there and be there. And we uh, love what God is doing, the story that he's writing. But uh, we'd also want to invite you to sow into that. So if, if you... Just have a heart to see the gospel continue to be spread in downtown San Diego to, to help build the staff and the team and so into that. Uh, feel free to, to do one of those three things, to either get involved and serve, specifically maybe you live closer to the city, uh, pray, we, we ask you and plead with you that you would just be joining us in prayer. And lastly, to give, if you would like to sow into the ministry that God is starting to develop there, we'd love for you to do that. And so, again, it's on our website under our giving tab. You're welcome to do that. Uh, but, again, that's a really short snippet. Go back last week if you missed it. You can hear more about it. But let's get our hearts ready to worship.
Happy 4th of July weekend. I uh, hope you guys are getting some time to be with family and friends and uh, just build that relationship. If you're a man or a woman who's actively serving our country, whether that's in a military sense or you're an educator or a nurse and you're just continuing to contribute to the place in which we live, honor you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, today's sermon actually uh, is somewhat timely. It, it speaks to the space we all live as if you are a follower of Jesus, around this idea of how as followers of Jesus, how is the church, what's, what's our relationship to culture? Um, how do we be Christian in America? And um, although obviously the scriptures are not speaking to our, our country per se, we find ourselves in Mark chapter 6 where we see this interesting um, connection between Jesus and his followers and the culture and even the political powers around him. And so my hope is that this would be an opportunity just to not only reflect on uh, kind of the, the freedoms we enjoy as a country, but also just to have uh, a, just a, maybe a deeper dialogue with the Lord about what's our role as the church, as followers of Jesus within whatever culture we watch this. We know there's actually people who actually watch this in other countries. Um, and so what does it look like for them in India or in the UK and South Africa if... Um, you know, and so as we even look at our demographics, I'm just I'm thinking about the sermon. Whatever culture you're in, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in that culture? And so we're going to be looking at Mark chapter six, and starting verse six, it says this: Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you to listen, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised from the dead. So uh, the the story goes on talking about just the, the tragic... Uh, ending of John's of John's life that he's beheaded by by Herod Antipas and uh, but it's interesting is that the next story talks about when the disciples come back and so it's Mark starts this section of his um, his story with kind of like a, a sandwich if you will the disciples go out there's a story of John the Baptist's death and then the disciples come back into Jesus and there's something about John's death that speaks to, um, centrally speaking, what Mark is trying to communicate to his readers about what it means to follow Jesus in a culture and in a world that doesn't want to receive what he's bringing. And if you've been tracking with us, you know that's exactly the audience that Mark is writing to. He's writing to an audience that is being actively persecuted, violently persecuted. And so to have a framework of discipleship that at its core tells of a man who is willing to lay down his life for the sake of advancing 
what God was doing in him uh, would have, have really hit home for them. I want to talk about four different themes that we find uh, talked about in this section and what does it look like uh, for the followers of Jesus back then to engage the culture around them and the political powers of the day? And then how do we translate that in our day and age? So here's the four points. Number one is that as followers of Jesus to the culture around us, we need to be kingdom centric. We need to be earthly nomadic. We need to be culturally prophetic and heavenly emphatic. And so I want to begin with this first idea of being kingdom centric. When Jesus sends them out, it says that he gives them authority and it tells them to go and preach, which we know from Mark 1, he's preaching about the, the gospel of the kingdom of God. But he gives them authority and it specifically highlights over impure spirits. And he begins to start telling this, this interesting narrative. If you read Mark again and again, it seems to really emphasize there's something happening in the spiritual realm. There is a war going on in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm, that Jesus is actively, actively giving his followers now, not just he has it, it's kind of a shift in the story, now his disciples have it. And I think that the reason why that's so important is because there was this high anticipation that the, the coming of God's kingdom would be attached to a, a political or militaristic move on behalf of the nation of Israel to regain uh, back their land from the Roman oppression. And that was kind of the anticipation of the day. But the authority that Jesus gives his disciples isn't over Roman centurions. It isn't given over to governors. It's the authority is given over demons. It, there seems to be a different war going on than the one that's apparently seen. I think that's our first clue if we're to ask ourselves a question, what's our relationship to the culture around us? Is what I found is that there tends to be this, this, this temptation within Christian culture to look at the predominant culture around the church as the enemy, and there's these culture wars that go on. And it doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be spoken into, that need to be revised and reformed. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I think oftentimes what you forget about is who are we actually fighting? Like who's actually the kingdom that we are trying to wage war against? And then what is the kingdom we're bringing? It, and, and I think the more time I spend talking with friends around the globe, the more I realize that it, we can become very narrow and thinking, oh, it's only this. But when we recognize for Jesus, there is a heavenly war going on that he is giving authority to his disciples to engage with. And I think that opens up a larger question of like, well, what is the kingdom of God? Like what, how do we define that? George, El, George Eldon Ladd wrote in his book, Gospel of the Kingdom, says this, the kingdom of God is his kingship his rule, his authority. When this is once realized, we can go through the New Testament and find passage after passage where this meaning is evident, where the kingdom is not a realm of people, but God's reign. Jesus said that we must receive the kingdom of God as little children. What is received? The church, heaven. What is received is God's rule. In order to enter the future realm of the kingdom, one must submit himself in perfect trust to God's rule here and now. We must also seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What is this object of our quest? Is it the church? Is it heaven? No. We are to seek God's righteousness, his sway, his rule, his reign in our lives. And so kind of a simple way you can think of this is when we speak of God's kingdom, think of it kingdom as king's domain, as anywhere God's rule and reign is. And the advancement, first and foremost, it seems to be through Mark's gospel, is against Satan and his demons and the enemy that, that we don't get to see in the natural very much. And I know that if you're hearing this and you don't have maybe a Christian tradition you're drawing from, that might just sound absolutely bizarre that we're talking about some sort of spiritual realm in kind of the secular society we live in. Don't we know better than that? Uh, but I also find that one of the fastest growing industries within film 
is the genre around horror, around the demonic. There's something fascinating about people being attached to, like there must be something else going on in the world. And I think it's less about kind of a, a Halloween capitalistic campaign. I think that there's something that we know that there is not only some sort of divine presence in the world, that there is an evil presence in the world. And Jesus speaks to it very plainly. So I would just invite you that through the space, just maybe suspend judgment for a minute because I think that there's something here that if you're willing, you can try and catch. And you might be like, well, what? If, if that's true, if God's rule and reign is coming against the rule and reign of darkness here on this earth, what does that look like? And I think the best thing we can do to answer that question is ask ourselves, well, what does God's kingdom look like in its perfect sense? And the only way we get to look at that currently is heaven. What does heaven look like? And advancing God's kingdom looks like advancing God's heavenly order, how things are in, in, in that redeemed space here on earth through prayer, through acts of love and kindness and compassion, through serving one another. And so, real quick, one of my favorite pictures of heaven comes from Revelation 21. It says this, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And so this, this picture of I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain with the old order of things. It's when we give our lives over to the things that bring life instead of death, that bring comfort where there's pain, that help restore order where there's disorder. When we participate in that sort of work in the name of Jesus, we are advancing God's heavenly order, His, His reign here on the earth against the brokenness um, that's all around us. N.T. Wright, in his book, Surprised by Hope, says it very plainly, says, What do you do in the present? Well, by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, will last into God's future. These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly or a little more bearable until the day when we leave it behind altogether. They are a part of what we may, be, we may call building for God's kingdom. And so I think as we open up this passage, what is, what is our relationship to the world around us? Well, we are sent out. We are the sent ones that God has, has told us to come and to preach, to proclaim, and also to demonstrate the power of his kingdom. And so whether you know this or not, as a follower of Jesus, you've been given authority through the Holy Spirit to go and to push back the disorder and the brokenness of darkness and to help bring beauty and restoration everywhere you go. It's an incredibly high calling that is at the heart of what Jesus is doing through his disciples. The second point is that as he's commissioning his disciples to go into culture, into the world around him, village to village, go be his agents of bringing his dominion into the world, he says something really pe peculiar. He says, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Kind of sounds like Encinitas people to me. Uh, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you, listen, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Now, there's a lot going on here. And, um, and even that last phrase always kind of struck me out. What does that mean? That like, so if you welcome into a house, stay there, bring blessing. If a house doesn't receive, you kick the dust off your feet. Well, that was an instruction to the Jewish nation that after they left Palestine and came back into Israel, they were literally supposed to shake off their sandals kick off the dust so they wouldn't pollute the Holy Land. And by Jesus saying this, what he's saying is there's something about what the kingdom I'm bringing that is not attached only to a geographical location or to an ethnic heritage. It's attached to something else. Ultimately, we see that as, as faith in him, as belief in him. But he, he tells them, he says, listen, don't, don't, don't bring a lot. 
This journey of discipleship you're going on is not about accumulation. It's not about comfort. And maybe we just need to pause right there. I want you just to ponder that for a second. The journey of discipleship Jesus is inviting us on is not about accumulation and it's not about comfort. It's about living into as um, agilely as possible, as dependent as possible into what Jesus has for you. James R. Edwards in his commentary says this, Minimal baggage is not itself a virtue, but a means of greater service and dependence on God. And its purpose is not protest, but rather proclamation of God's coming rule. True service of Jesus is characterized by dependence on Jesus. And dependence on Jesus is signified by going where Jesus sends despite material shortfalls and unanswered questions. I love this because sometimes we can make this picture of simplicity almost like the goal. And Edward says, it's not, that's really not the virtue in and of itself. The virtue is dependence o- over the simplicity. And there's something to be said about simplicity, but... The idea is if you are following Jesus, this isn't about the perfect plan that's laid out in front of you that otherwise it's requiring no faith from you and it may not even requiring any sense of, of obedience to him. It's just strategic. But following Jesus looks like that part of our proclamation of the kingdom of God is our reliance on the king. Part of us stepping into the journey of following Jesus is saying, I'm not following the ways of the world. And so that looks like here on the earth that there's a nomadic sense to what we do. Uh, for a long time, the, the surf company Reef, their, kind of, their, their logo, there used to be a big billboard next to Lofty Coffee. And it just said, just passing through. Um, and I loved that, that wording and that imagery. That there's something here on the earth that it doesn't mean that we're not trying to provide for our family or we're not trying to work hard. It just means that there's, there's a different sort of framework we have when we have a kingdom framework. Our relationship to the culture around us is we don't play the same games that they do. That we're not trying to make the corporate ladder or upward mobility or more accumulation the goal of our following Jesus because why we're just passing through. That there's this nomadic sense to what we have. And in the same way, and you might be in feels right now, you following Jesus has maybe cost you some sort of material blessing you were hoping to have here on the earth. But I think that there's something beautiful about saying, I'm, I may be giving up something here. But what God is inviting us into is not a, a, a life of lack, but it's abundance. But it's a different orientation for us around what does that look like. The third part we want to look at is, what does it look like for us to be culturally prophetic? So the story pauses, and then all of a sudden starts talking about John the Baptist. And then it goes back to the disciples who were sent out two by two. And as it pauses, it's, it's on purpose. It says this, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are now at work in him. Others said... He's Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. And I wanted to pause right here, because if you know the story, um, if you keep reading, you'll find the story, that the reason why John was in prison, and the reason why John was ultimately beheaded, is because Herod Antipas, who was, was one of the, the sons of Herod the Great, stole his half-brother, uh, Philip wife to come be his wife and by doing so he kind of cast off the current wife he had well the current wife that he had that he cast off uh, ended up being a political movie it was the daughter of a king a few hundred miles away who ends up actually coming over and attacking Herod Antipas so this is all sorts of weird political stuff going on here but in the midst of that John the Baptist before he died spoke prophetically against the actions of Herod Antipas. He just said, you can't do this. You can't steal your brother's wife and make her your own. And on top of that, their da- or her daughter ends up dancing in front of them. There's just so much sexual brokenness and promiscuity and just, just like backbiting family stuff. And John the Baptist speaks to the most prominent political figure in that region. And because of that, as one does, you get thrown into prison. And Herodias, 
the, the woman that was stolen from Philip and married to Herod Antipas is so angry at John the Baptist for his, his prophetic witness against the wrongs that were being done is she's the one ultimately who orders his execution. Which I think brings up a lot of questions that may, may speak to kind of how we opened up the sermon. What's our response to culture in specifically in a culture that's not built around biblical values or the kingdom of God. It's, it, you know, and that could be for whatever culture you're in, the chances are, unless you are living right now in heaven, you are a part of a culture that has fractures and brokenness and sometimes just absolute atrocities going on. What's our response? Are, do, we, do we speak to it? Or do we... Do we campaign against it? What's our role as a church in that? And so I wanted to just spend a minute just to kind of unpack that a little bit. And the reason I want to spend a little bit on this is because I think every one of us feels at this visceral level the, the division and the polarization that's gone on, especially the past couple of years. Mark Sayers, in his book, A Non-Anxious Presence, writes extensively about this. And he, he describes, he's a, he's a pastor, but also a historian and sociologist in Australia. He refers to, this, to the season that we're in as a globe right now, as a global village, that we are in what's called a gray zone. We're in between these two things. There should be an image on your screen of, of these two eras that there's the passing era and the coming era, era, and in the middle of it is this gray zone. And he writes this, one of the impacts of the global pandemic was to accelerate us towards the inflection points. The pandemic didn't just change the world, it was a signal of the change already happening in the world. Often as eras pass, their traits intensify. The world was already a change-rich environment. The pandemic was a harbinger that the continual and accelerated change was here to stay. I love what he says. Is it's not like so much that the pandemic brought new things. It just accelerated the tension that already existed in our culture. That's what happens in these gray zones. But it's also in those gray zones that become rich soil for revival and renewal. Randall Schweller, who's a political scientist, uh, before COVID even happened, said this, the world is undergoing transformation, a chaotic period where most anything can happen and little can be predicted, where yesterday's rule takers become tomorrow's rule makers, but no one follows rules anymore, where competing global visions collide with each other, where remnants of the past, present, and future coexist simultaneously. And so there is this, this tension we all feel in our souls and our bodies, of like just kind of this like these wars of these two eras, the past and the era and the coming era and this gray zone that we're in. And, and a part of that is the church has been wrapped up in that. The church has been wrapped up in this tension. And there's kind of there's two kind of frames of thought is that either the the passing era will just pass away, and that would include what we know of as church and faith um, or is there an option for renewal uh, kind of the more negative framework Oswald Spangler German historian says all civilizations are born grow then age decline and die uh, he wrote this after World War II and is talking about everyone goes in that cycle um, which is pretty bleak and some people believe that around the same time a British historian by the name of Arnold Toynbee uh, had a different point of view he said, civilizations have a spiritual dimension. They can be restored, but only a creative minority can do it by those who are proactively respond to a civilization's crises and whose response allows that civilization, civilization to grow. And, he, and he's not talking about specifically the church, but I think about how the church has been caught up in the middle of this very tense culture wars going on and the passing era and the coming era. And he speaks to this, this is written 100 years ago, but he says, the only way that true change can happen is through a creative minority, a small group of people committed so heavily to a cause that they're willing to lay it all down for it. And within that small yet vibrant community, when given itself over to it, creates something beautiful and sustainable. And so how do we do that as a church? How do we become a creative minority in a world that very much feels like 
it's, it's kind of losing its room, its gravitational presence. Well, there's five kind of views of how the church relates to culture. And what are we supposed to do to the culture around us? This is taken from uh, my professor, Dr. Gary Bashirs. It's kind of five tip, typical things that you do. Number one is triumphant. The gospel will prevail and the world will be Christianized. This idea of domination, that the only way to, for the hope of the world is for, the Christi, for Christians to be able to dominate the predominant society around them. The next view is what's called transforming where Christians will penetrate society and convert the values and goals of secular culture into the service of the kingdom of God. Elect the right people, get them into office, get them into power, throw enough money, and we can make our nation, whatever nation you're a part of, align with kind of the, the biblical values that we're wanting for. The third option is the prophetic. It says, as it proclaims the gospel and seeks to win people to Christ, the church proclaims righteousness in the culture by deeds and words and exposes its evil in the context of grace. So it's not passive, it's prophetic, but it does this in a sense of speaking rather through domination and kind of this triumphal type thing, and rather than assuming that every part of culture will be transformed into this... Uh, to aligning its values, you become this prophetic witness, this creative minority to it. You can probably tell which one I, I kind of vie for. The fourth one is revival. If the proclamation of the gospel results in revival, society will improve as a secondary effect. So you just pray for revival, because if revival happens, then society changes. But other than that, there's no hope for society. And lastly, it's the lifeboat model. Only Messiah can change society. We save people from the world, Satan's domain, and bring them into the church community that practices a separation of church and state. You hide away, you get in the lifeboat, you hang on till heaven. And there's these, this massive spectrum in between. And what, what I find is that without even knowing it, you kind of belong to one of these camps. And what I would just encourage you is when we look at the life of Jesus, the life of John the Baptist, of his disciples, is that they didn't campaign to go and overthrow Rome. They didn't go and try and talk to kind of the higher up governors of the day to try and reform their things. And at the same time, there's, there was moments where John the Baptist speaks prophetically to the ruler of that nation. There's times when Jesus speaks to the religious rulers of the day very directly and very clearly. And recognizing that there are moments that even as, I mean, talk about a small group of people, the, the followers of Jesus made up just a few um, you know, 72 people, maybe a few hundred people most, and became this change agent in the world as this kind of prophetic influence. And it also doesn't really make sense just to hide away and be like, there's no hope. And so, again, th these are all different kind of frameworks. You don't have to, like, you don't have to choose one today. But I'm just saying, maybe think about what is your role, the church's role within the culture that we have around us. And then it's the last thing I wanted to share is that we'd be heavenly emphatic. I, I love this line that Herod says after he hears all the rumors of who people think Jesus is. He says, but when Herod heard this, he said, John whom I have beheaded has been raised from the dead. And what I love about that line is he was more accurate than he realized. That by trying to throw John's life away. It only resulted in resurrection. And that is the ultimate framework of the kingdom of God. It's about resurrection. It's about life. It's about how we bring that in a redemptive sense, but it's also our anticipation of where we're going. It's, it's our emphasis. It's the heavenly emphatic that this is what it, it draws our attention and excites us. And I just wanted to, just to draw us back to this of where as a culture, or what's our relationship as a church to the culture around us? Well, it looks like we bring heaven here on earth. And even if earth tries to destroy, we know that ultimately we only end in heaven anyways. Um, last night, last story, um, I got to have dinner with my grandma. And um, she's one of my heroes. And uh, it was a very special dinner because my grandpa actually uh, went to go be with Jesus about a week and a half ago. 
And uh, that's been a, a massive shift for my grandma. My grandpa is one of the biggest influences on my life as a child to see a man of God love the way that he did and continue to do so into my adulthood. And we brought her over to our house for dinner, and it was a, it was a very sweet time. And we sang songs and read scripture. And as I'm driving her back to her place, uh, we listened to uh, we listened to the Gaithers and uh, Sandy Patty and some of the the kind of the gospel worship singers that she loved so much. And this song came on that I had never heard before called "We Shall Behold Him." Says the sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The star shall applaud him with thunders of praise. The sweet light in his eyes shall enhance those awaiting, and we shall behold him then face to face. Oh, we shall behold him, we shall behold him face to face in all of his glory. Oh, we shall behold him, yes, we shall behold him face to face, our Savior and Lord. And as we're listening to the song, after the song ends, I look over at my grandma and she's in tears and she says, it's true. We will behold him and, and my grandpa's beholding him right now. And so it's, it's remembering that that is our relationship to culture. It's, it's heaven. God's reign, his rule comes now through his disciples, his followers. We, we come um, as on this, in this temporary place called earth, we do eternal business. We are that culturally prophetic voice. We, are, we care for those around us. And ultimately, we know that even if we find ourselves in places where our earthly body is destroyed, it ends in heaven, right? It's, it's the promise of not only what we're bringing, but where we're going. And it's those two things together that gives us a hope that does not disappoint. So let me pray for you. Lord, thank you so much that you love us and care for us, Jesus. I pray that you would be with uh, each one of us, Lord God, as we think about the nation we're in this week, celebrating the, the freedoms, God, that we get to enjoy. Um, Lord, we also ask that you would remind us we're a part of a bigger story. God, that you have given us a unique call to the culture around us, Lord God, that we would not be swept up in the agenda and the priorities of the world around us, but God, we'd be motivated by love and by your spirit to be a witness of your care and your comfort, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Awake.
Please.